Janelle had just turned four years old. She was sweet, kind, loving, and innocent. I can't imagine how scared she was with no one around to protect her. Charlie took it upon himself to take the life of an innocent child, bud, baby cousin, who couldn't defend herself even if she wanted to, who caused no harm to others. He had the chance to stop and realize that his actions were wrong, but he didn't. He watched her as she slept, pacing back and forth to make that final decision of, pace, of placing his hand over her tiny mouth no. and watched her struggle and grasp for air. On April 8th, 1994, this monster sexually assaulted and then killed his four-year-old cousin because, to quote his confession, he wanted to know what it would feel like. If you're asking yourself, well, why is he here having a chance at freedom? It's because he committed this crime one week before his 18th birthday. So according to the eyes of the law, he's a juvenile and he falls under the act of 1584. So here we are with the monster having a chance at freedom. They don't get into the details on this hearing. So we will go through that afterwards with that. Let's jump in. Morning, Mr. Amber. Morning. My name is Parole Officer Logan. Today is Friday, March 22nd, 2024. And this is the public at 1584 hearing of the Connecticut Board of Pardons and Paroles. Mr. Amber, for the record, the state of Connecticut passed and made effective October 1st, 2015, Public Act 1584, an act concerning lengthy sentences for crimes committed by a child of youth and the sentencing of a child of youth convicted of certain felony offenses. You fall under this act, and basically this means that you were, sorry, you fall mm -hmm. under this act. Basically this means that you were under the age of 18 and that the board shall give great weight to the diminished culpabilities of juveniles as compared to adults, the hallmark features of youth, and any subsequent growth and maturity that you displayed while we are reviewing you for suitability today. Mm -hmm. Following board members are present this morning, and by stating their names on the record, Certified they have reviewed all statutorily required documents in preparation of this hearing. Good morning, sir. I'm Jennifer Zappanini. Panel member, please. Good morning. Good morning, Deborah Smith Palmieri. Good morning. Also in attendance this morning is the public defender. Can you please state your name, jurist number, and business address? My name is Melanie Frank. My jurist number is 417-500. Business no one present from the state's attorney's office. All others present this morning in regard to this hearing, please state your name for the record. Kristen Gardner. Carolee Gold for the public defender's office. Thank you. Also present today is victim advocate Hamlet Williams. Mr. Amber, please state your name and inmate number for the record. Caesar Amber, 229-555. This is a public hearing in accordance with Chapter 14 Freedom of Information Act, Connecticut General Statute 1200, which applies to this procedure. Mr. Amber, if you have any questions concerning the above, please bring your questions to the attention of the panel at this time. No questions at this time. And this is a public hearing. Do you have any questions and are you willing to proceed? No questions. This 1584 hearing is being conducted in consideration of the parole application for Caesar Amber, who was serving 60 years for murder, 20 years concurrent for sexual assault first, victim less than 13, after two years, two years, sorry, after two or more years older, and 10 years for risk of injury to a child. Total effective sentence is 60 years flat. Mr. Amber must also register as a sex offender. The time frame is unclear. There is victim input in this case. There is an offender accountability plan for the offender. It has been reviewed and shows he has completed the track one sex offender program, voices, anger management, tier two, Garner facility-based programs, start now, module four, cold coring disorders. He has obtained his GED. He is a Braille transcriber and he has completed a legal assistant program through Blackstone. He also works in the kitchen. Utilizing the statewide collaborative offender risk evaluation system, the offender's overall score on the RT falls within the low range of risk to recidivism. Mr. Amber, this is your opportunity to express to the board 
why do you believe you should be granted parole? You make again. I would like to begin by saying thank you for the okay. opportunity to speak before you today and for allowing me to express how deeply remorseful I am for the immeasurable suffering that my actions have caused to my cousin Patty because I killed her daughter. I hope that my cousin Patty can one day forgive me. I understand that there are no amount of apologies and words that can ever put back together what I have torn apart. My victim's family is my family. I called my cousin, my victim's mother, early in my incarceration to apologize, but she hung up immediately when she heard my voice. And then I learned I was not allowed to do that, so I have not been able to apologize. I know that I split my family between those that understand I have mental health issues and have forgiven me, and those that will never forgive me, speak to me or speak to anyone in my family who does speak to me because of what I did. My cousin had a daughter a few years later. She was born on the day I killed the first daughter. I know every year and I know every day too, my cousin is reminded of her first daughter, is not there and has never been able to express the celebration every mom should be able to on their child's birthday. I know this also applies to everyone in the family, including the birthday girl or woman herself. For the first five or so years, I refused to accept what I had done. I denied it to myself and to others because I believed it would be easier to live with. I believed that if I lied and denied my actions long enough, I could fool everyone and I could stop feeling disgusted and ashamed because of the nature of my crimes. I was afraid of being attacked physically and ostracized by everyone. If you read my disciplinary history, you saw that I asked to be part of a gang because I feared for my safety inside and wanted the protection I thought they could give me. I never became a part of any gang. At the time, at the same time, I did not want to put any part of my family through a trial. I pled and received the maximum penalty. Because of the help that I received from Mrs. Davis, my DOC mental health counselor, who I met shortly after I was sentenced, I was able to eventually take responsibility for what I had done and begin to deal with the nature of my actions. I was on medication and in counseling too. Mrs. Davis was the one who helped me realize how important it is to take and continue taking my mental health medications. She also ran the Lifers Group and encouraged me to join. Participating in her Lifers Group helped me to develop the ability to self-examine, to learn, and use proper coping skills to accept responsibility for all of my actions, whether in the past or future. Once I started being honest with myself, I was able to understand everything about my life that were contributors and not excuses, including my mental illness. At the time of my crimes, my mind was broken and I was flooded with thoughts and emotions that I couldn't understand. Growing up in New York with my mother and sister was normal and among my happiest memories. I never realized how my behavior was different from other kids. When I was in the fifth grade, the school suggested to my mother that I attend Presbyterian Hospital for children with mental illness problems. I like I'm gonna stop. Can I just stop you for one second, sir? Mr. Ambert, I just, and I should have made this statement earlier. I wanna remind you that we're live streaming and some of the information that you may be disclosing is uh, protected information for your benefit. Um, we will at some point go into executive session to discuss confidential information. I just want you to be aware if you choose to waive that confidentiality and speak about it, that's fine. But the, the panel will not discuss these things in, in, a, in the live stream setting with you. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> I, I liked it there. The class was small, which made it easier for me to focus and learn and I was able to participate in elective classes like cooking and photography. There was a part of the school that I hated. During the day in between classes, we would be taken to a separate room where we underwent psychological testing and I was prescribed Ritalin, which gave me brain fog and made me slow. I begged my mother to let me stop taking it and she did. 
For junior high, I went back to public school, IS-52. I got decent grades, but got into more trouble. My mother tried her best. She was always trying to understand, and I couldn't explain what I was feeling. I had no understanding about what was happening. I went to live with my aunt Carmen. It was really around this time that I started cutting myself because at the time, it was the only way I knew how to get rid of voices. Like my mother did when I lived with her, my aunt tried her, tried to get help, but I didn't know nor understand what was happening to me. After a while, I wanted to go back with my mother because I missed her so much. So eventually my aunt took me back to her. By this time, she moved to Connecticut in Hartford. I was back with my mother, but really hadn't participated in counseling. I had no ability, no coping skills to deal with what was happening to me. I started to drink and smoke weed, and I was using cocaine and heroin until the age of 17. One day I realized that all of the anger, violent thoughts and voices were too much for me to handle. So I finally asked my mother for help. She tried to help me by taking me to the Institute of Living. Unfortunately, they denied me. I was finally able to participate in mental health groups through the years I have participated in many after I was in prison. There are some groups in particular that were important, instrumental in giving me a better understanding of my emotions, behaviors, and the ability to respond differently than I did in the past with empathy as my guide. In 2004, I participated in the Tier 2 Drug and Alcohol Program that was run by Councilman Scopus. This group showed me how powerful and destructive drugs and alcohol addiction truly is, not only for me and my family, who have a front row seat to my addictions and the chaos it brings, but all who are affected by my actions and addiction. I learned how to identify social and personal triggers that may lead to a relapse, such as being around violence or others using drugs, and how to use the stop, observe, evaluate, decide, and act coping skills I learned to help me deal with any cravings to use again I may have. At Garner, I participated in anger management run by Mr. Mahilo. In anger management, I learned that there's a big difference between anger and rage. I learned that it's okay to get angry. It's what you do with your anger that will affect others. Anger management taught me and reinforced the same skills tier two taught me. The sex offenders group, I learned that I had an entitled and distorted way of thinking. I believe that because of what I went through as a child, it somehow made the world owe me. And I also learned that the power I believe that I possessed over my victim was a lie. I learned how this type of behavior has a long and devastating effect on people who have been sexually victimized. Once and if I am released, I will continue to participate in sex offenders groups. In Voices, that was run by Mrs. O'Donnell, I learned how many, I learned how my violent actions have a lasting effect on my entire community. And that empathy is the ability to stop and put myself in the shoes of others, a crucial part of every coping skill. I have been committed to working on changing the way I think, the way I interact with others, the way I treat others, and on educating myself by getting my GED, learning how to draw, even becoming a tutor and helping others get their GEDs. I became a certified Braille transcriber and I had the pleasure of transcribing many books for the Library of Congress, which even today gives the visually impaired the opportunity to read books. As an instructor, I was privileged to help other men become certified brailers. Through teaching, I've learned you need to learn from your students to best help them. You need to learn where and who they are to be able to teach them the right information with the right correct timing. I eventually ran the Braille program at Cheshire. Working alongside my counselor, Ms. Lozier, and Nancy Mother Seal, the Braille coordinator for the Bureau of Education and Services for the Blind. Participating in the DOC's art program 
gave me the opportunity to send some of my artwork to art galleries, which like the books I transcribed, allow me to affect society in a positive way. I continued my education by receiving my legal assistant paralegal degree from Blackstone's School of Law, my credentials of ministry, and an honorary, an honorary doctor of divinity degree from the Universal Life Church. While at Garner, I took the opportunity to participate in some groups that were not on my offender accountability programs. The Rational Behavior Therapy Group run by Mrs. Tamara, CSW, and a post-traumatic stress disorder group run by clinician Kathy Roach. I have been enrolled in the Table Foundation and an Islamic school for a few years now. I have been a practicing Muslim since 2016. Islam has brought peace into my life and has helped me not only feel connected to God, but it's also helped me understand love, kindness, patience, charity, and what it takes to develop a moral character. I have been studying Arabic and have the honor of helping and mentoring the Muslims in my unit. Mentoring, has, mentoring and helping others make, makes me feel grateful that even after everything I have experienced in my life growing up, everything that I did, including the horrible crime that led to my incarceration, and even after living in prison for 30 years, that I have the resources and qualities in me that have allowed me to grow during my incarceration and further help others. And through helping others, I can really see that to be true. I want to continue my service to others when I am raised. I would like to serve as a mentor to others, and I know that it would be limited to adults because of my charges. I believe I could do this in Islamic faith. This would be one of my everyday practices of empathy. I have spoken to my imam about participating in Talim classes, which is the study of multiple Islamic subjects like Arabic, commentary on the Quran, and Islamic law. After a time of further learning in the community, for I would hope to transition to a teaching mentorship. I've worked in the kitchen for the past 13 years as a cook, and now three as the head cook for the entire facility. Over the years, I have earned the trust and respect of my supervisors. And I have the pleasure of being mentored and taught how to cook by Supervisor Martin. Once, and if released, I would really like to continue learning how to cook by going to a culinary art school when I am released, whenever that is. Walking into the halfway house, I will ask for a case manager to assure counseling for mental health and meds. Ask for career services liaison at the halfway house for help looking for a job at restaurants that I can take a bus to. My supervisor in the kitchen, Mrs. Stepanian, had offered to help me get a job at a pizza restaurant whose owner she knows in the Hartford area, but my plans, my plan is to go to New Haven. I'm most interested in applying at Yale Dining Hall because I know they hire formerly incarcerated people with serious charges. I know I am leaving with my state ID. I will make an appointment at the DMV to take the test for my learner's permit that I have been studying for. I know I have to wait 90 days to get my license, but I want to prioritize getting a license. My plan would be to transition with support to the community and would love to eventually have my own apartment, but I am open to learning the best way to get there. I also intend to find a near by AA meeting and begin attending them for support. My biggest challenge will be reconnecting with my mom. My mom was always my biggest advocate and took care of me the best she could. Now she has dementia and although I talked to her on the phone, the last time I saw her was 2015 because of her dementia. Reforming an in-person and totally different relationship. I will learn about her illness and how I could be connected with her and be her support like she was always mine. Also my sisters, Nadine was an infant when I was incarcerated and now she has a son herself and I returned to her as an adult. We talk frequently, but I plan to spend time with her so we can form an in-person relationship. 
My sister, Rachel, who I grew up with and was 15 at the time I was incarcerated, and now lives in Florida with her five kids. So I'll have to adjust to a new long distance aspect to our relationship that didn't exist before. Before my incarceration, I was used to seeing her there when I got home. Now I will learn to use FaceTime so I can see her and talk to her as much as possible. That will be my biggest challenge. I also have some anxiety about re-entering a very different world than I left. Life is more fast paced than in the 90s and definitely more fast paced than in prison where I have lived for 30 years. I've talked to many guys who have gone home and their number one piece of advice is to take advantage of every program, opportunity, and support you have to have access to. That is my plan. So though I have anxiety about it, I am looking forward to doing it. I have a plan to keep a positive structure for myself as I come back home. First is the halfway house and going to a job, going to school, going to therapy, AA meeting, and taking my meds, checking in with my parole officer, having responsibilities I haven't had in DOC, like going to the grocery store and paying my own bills. I think all of that would be a good positive structure for me. I would like to thank DOC for offering groups that have helped me and has given me the necessary skills to live a productive and meaningful life. I thank you again for allowing me to speak in front of you today. I want to close by apologizing for taking a life before it got started and for shattering a once close-knit family. Okay, thank you for your statement, Mr. Ambert. So we do have questions for you. You covered a lot in your opening statement and we certainly appreciate you taking the time to put that together for us. Uh, we also reviewed the packet from your attorney. And we, we have new information as late as, as yesterday. So we're very familiar with your case from, from the time of the offense throughout your 30 years of incarceration and, and where you are today. So we have thoroughly reviewed that as a panel. Uh, when we're done with our questioning, we'll turn the hearing over to the Office of Victim Services for input there, and your attorney will have an opportunity to speak on your behalf. We'll deliberate after all of that and give you our decision today. Okay? Yes. Mr. Amber, this is just a, a, such a tragic situation uh, for so many people involved, and I, I think you covered that. Uh, most importantly, a child. Uh, lost her life and her family lost her uh, it's very clear that you're you're a bright man you've done a lot during this incarceration and you've continued to educate yourself get involved in programming uh, you've worked you've even gone as far as um, mentoring and, and tutoring others so um such a shame that you've lost all these years as well because all of that could have been used uh, towards towards something else. I, I don't want to rehear the case, but I do want to ask you, do you recall your offense? Yes, ma'am. We're not going to go over all the details. I don't want to retry it, but so you remember everything that happened? Yes, ma'am. Okay, because at, at some point there were a couple different versions about what happened. Um, so I, I just I I, I want to make clear you take responsibility for the the sexual assault and the murder. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for answering that. Um, and, and you know we read all about your your childhood and and um, you know where you were at, at the time this happened. Were you actively using? Uh, the alcohol, cocaine, and heroin at the time of your offense? Alcohol. So, so when you committed the offense, you were under the influence of alcohol? No, ma'am. It was earlier. I was drinking. Okay. Were you intoxicated when, when this offense occurred? No, ma'am. Okay. Okay. And, and, and 
at the time, were you involved in programming treatment of any kind in the community? No, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Well, we did read about the different the different uh, forms and types of treatment that you've engaged in. Um, what do you see as the biggest difference from the time you committed that offense until now in your thinking? I think, but the biggest difference back then from, uh, from back then to now is I have the ability to clear think the uh, clear. Sorry, I'm nervous. I have the ability to think clearly now. Through the years of the counseling and medication and understanding what empathy really truly is, I'm able to stop and to think about my actions way before I ever can do anything that would affect anybody. And I, I'm sorry, I, it's okay. Did you lose your thought? It's okay. We can we can move on. You can always come back to it. Um, I, I did make note that in your in your disciplinary reports, and I think you've only had seven in thirty years. Um, uh, I don't see any violence. So, have mm -hmm. you had any urges throughout the years to hurt anyone in the in the prisons? No, ma'am. Have you had any fights with anybody? No. All right. So those those urges just went away when you came into the prisons? No, I went through a lot of therapy. I had a lot of therapy through mental health. Um, as I stated before, Mrs. Davis was very instrumental in her life as group to help me. Anger management helped me also. And help me to understand, like I said in my opening statement, it's okay to get angry, but I don't have to always act on my anger. There's a lot better ways to deal with that. And I don't want to ever, and I always maintain that, that I don't ever want to hurt anybody ever again. So I strive very hard to make sure I don't do that. Okay, but is that something you have to work hard at? No, ma'am. Okay. You said in your your interview with the, the parole officer when, when asked, you know, why you committed these offenses, that you don't know. You don't know why you did it. But is that the truth? Have you come any closer to understanding why you committed these offenses? Yes. Yes, I have. Um, I know that my mental illness had a big part to play in it. it. Took me a long time to honestly admit that at first because I didn't want to use it as the ultimate excuse. And I still don't. I know that, like I said before, it's a contributor, but not an excuse to it. So I do understand that, that it was my mental illness. Okay. You also mentioned earlier that you were in denial and, and you lied about committing the offense. So at what point did you come to terms and openly speak about committing these offenses? It was during the lifers group with Ms. Davis. And what year was that? In the early 2000s. Okay. So you think that that group gave you this, the space to come to terms with what you had done? Yes, ma'am. And what about your family? Did you have the opportunity to discuss your offenses with the family members that you say still support you? Yeah. My mother and my sisters. You spoke to them about it? Yes. Okay. Uh, who do you talk to now? My mother and my sisters, my nephew. Okay. okay. But your, your mom's, you mentioned your, your mother's health is, is declining. How often do you speak to your sisters? 
Uh, as often as I can. Probably one week. Okay, if I, like weekly, monthly, yearly? Uh, I try weekly. Okay. They have jobs, so I try weekly though. Okay. Are you, are you, fear? you mentioned that you'd be anxious about getting out. Are you fearful that something like this might happen again in the future, that you might commit similar offenses? No, ma'am. I'm not. No doubts at all? No. Okay. Um, I, I do want to ask you some confidential questions off the record, but I'm first going to see if my uh, colleagues have questions they'd like to ask before we do that. Ms. Palmieri? So, thank you, Madam Chair. So, Mr. Amber, you uh, mentioned during one of your interviews that you were feeling anxious leading up to this hearing today. Can you tell me some strategies you use to manage your anxiety? I took advantage of my mental health caseworker. So I was able to speak to her. Uh, and I have been fortunate to have other prisoners around me that have known me my whole entire incarceration. So they've helped me. And I've spoken to my sisters and they've also helped me. So, so by talking through the situations, that's how you've sort of um, gone gone through this period of anxiety leading up today to, to today's hearing. Yes, ma'am. OK, thank you for that. Um, you mentioned um, I, I knew, that you've taken a number of programs. And you you took the sex offender treatment program. Uh, can you tell me what's the most significant thing that you've taken from that program? Other than responsibility. Okay. Mention um, that. Yeah. I took away the pain and the long lasting effect that victimizing a person sexually has on them. I know I was it doesn't only extend to that one act or multiple acts at that time. It's a long lasting effect. I learned that the person may suffer from anxiety, relationship issues, may never be able to get married because of the abuse of the sexual victimization. And I learned that it's never, ever okay to violate someone in that way, ever. Um, the chair asked you a little bit about uh, any concerns you have about being in the community. What would be, what are you concerned about? How do you see, the, what do you see as being difficult or challenging? Well, the biggest challenge, like I said, was reconnecting with my mother and sisters. I know that a challenge also is getting the job. Um, I know that because of the nature of my crimes, it will be difficult. But I have dealt with issues like that in prison. So I understand that that's going to happen. And the best reaction to that is really just to accept it and just move on and to continue to look for jobs. And eventually, one will hire me and I will succeed in there. Have you had difficulties while you've been in the facility because of your charges? At the beginning, yes, ma'am. But how long ago? When you say in the beginning, the first few years or the last 10 years? The first about 10 or 15 years of my incarceration was difficult. Okay. How did you manage that? Counseling, a lot of counseling and if I needed to, I would remove myself from situations by asking to be moved to another facility or another unit. And um, the unit managers, they would understand my situation and they were more than happy to accommodate the move so that I wouldn't get in trouble or attacked. You know, we it was said earlier, you know, you've served about 30 years so far. 
in the in the 30 years, you've had only seven disciplinary reports, and the majority of them were very, very early uh, in your sentence. What do you what do you feel is your biggest accomplishment in in this time period? I think my biggest accomplishment has been my mental health. I, uh, being in a good place, mental health wise, my education has been also a very big part of it. Being able to help others. Being able to be in positions where I was respected by people who otherwise may not have. And understanding. I'm when sorry, you say, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm, I'm sorry. When you say positions, were you referring to your employment, your job at the facility? Yes, and, and other places too for mentoring and places like that and doing stuff like that. Did you have a mentor or somebody that to help you other than the counselors throughout your early years? Yes, actually I have. I had um, a celly, actually, a cellmate that was a big mentor to me. Um, he actually was the one who helped me and helped me understand that I had a long road ahead of me and that it was better for me to go to school and find things that would be better for me to occupy my time than to just do nothing and get in trouble and educate myself. At the time, I didn't, this avenue wasn't available to me. So he advised me that it didn't matter how much time I had, that it was better for my growth to do it anyway. So he was a big influence and big mentor to me. He unfortunately passed away, but he, he was a good mentor. So, you know, when, when we have these hearings, we, we look at rehabilitation, you know, and what you've done to do, what a person has done to demonstrate that they've rehabilitated themselves and have the, the, the ability to reintegrate into the community in a positive way. What does reintegration mean to you when somebody says, asks you, you know, um, about reintegrating to the community? What do you, what does that mean to you? It means re-entering a society that I was gone from for a long time. Um, it means starting over. It means contributing to society when I didn't have the chance to before. Being productive in society. Being able to contribute in positive ways. Not to be a burden to society either. And to understand the challenges, but to be able to and understand that I can overcome the challenges. It takes time, but I can do it. And do you see yourself as a person who's been rehabilitated? Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you, Mr. Amber. I do not have any additional questions at this time. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Page? Thank you, Chair. Um, so, Mr. Uh, Amber, I just had a few uh, questions about um, um, your relationship with the victim. Um, so this was your cousin. Was are they? Were you related through your mother or father? Through my mother. And so your mom and the victim's mom. Were sisters? No, she is my mother's niece. And, and um, how many children did your cousin have? I do not know at this time. At that, when you were watching, babysitting them, you didn't know how many oh, children? Um, um, uh, four, I believe. And out of the the uh, the four children, how did you 
how did you pick this victim? I have fixated in the morning, that morning, and that, sorry, that fixation never left. With just, with her? Yes, ma'am. So what were the sex of the other children? The gender? One male and the rest were female. And she was the oldest? Yes, ma'am. And so your mother now, at least I understand that she is ailing, um, but her relationship with her sister, do you know anything about that? Not really. I know in the past that they would uh, still meet up and talk to each other. So do you think that this offense has divided your family? Yes, ma'am. And do you think that your mom has any contact with any of her nieces from her sister? From her sister? I think so. Okay. So my understanding of this is that you committed this offense just one month shy of your 18th birthday. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, have you ever sought any other um, forms of relief from this sentence? Any other court proceedings, modifications? No. Um, yeah, um, I did file. I was filed. Sorry, I filed a, a petition to correct the legal sentence was filed. And um, what was that? I can't remember when this when the juvenile bill had first uh, got passed. Okay, so in 2015, is that? I believe so. Yes, I was at Gardner when I was going to court for that. So what what, what you thought that your sentence was too lengthy? Is that what it is? No, ma'am. I was automatically um. That uh, correction, to, uh, that file, that motion to correct the legal sentence was an automatic filing for me because of the juvenile law. Okay, okay. There, it was never modified, right? No, no. All right. So one last question. I know you said that you participated in the sex offender treatment, and one of the things you learned about was was empathy. And I have to be honest with you. When I was reviewing this case, my heart kind of sank to my stomach. Because as a mother, I just could not, I, I, I just couldn't fathom this happening to me. So I, I would ask you, what would happen or what, how would you feel if this was your sister or, you know, someone a little bit closer to you than a, the second cousin? I would feel devastated, destroyed confused, angry, and hurt. And would you think that that person deserved a second chance? If I'm being honest, no. I appreciate that. I can appreciate your honesty. This, this was really very difficult to read about, Mr. Amber, but I am happy that you have taken time to work on this stuff because it was very, it's very important. Um, and I, like the chair mentioned, there was a few discrepancies between some dates and kind of the things that you got, did while you were there in the facility that I think we'll discuss in um, executive session. But I do appreciate the information that you've provided thus far. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I want to point out that we did receive a multitude of uh, support letters from other inmates, from staff at the facility. Um, I also want to note for the record that you're receiving 12 days of statutory good time because of the sentencing laws that were in effect at the time of your uh, conviction. So um, 
if you continue to earn 12 days a month, you're you're estimated to be released the end of 2035. Yes. Okay, this time I'm gonna make a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of considering confidential inmate information. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we're gonna go into executive session and, and we'll be right back. We've been receiving again. Oh, we're receiving during the hearing. She, she did it from the other side. This, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Mr. Amber, can you call the CEO into the room, please? Can stop them. Yeah. Right now, there's no CO outside. Okay, give us just a moment. Hello. Yeah, that. Hello. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna need Stop. you to hang up on your end, and the board is gonna call back, um, so we can speak privately with Mr. Ann Bear. So if sure. you just want to yeah. press, if you want to press the red button to hang up, in about 30 seconds, you're gonna get a new invitation that appears on screen, and you can accept that. You got it. Sounds good. Thank you. No okay, we're back on the record and we're live streaming again. Are there any other questions from the panel members? Okay, so at this time, we'll turn the hearing over to the Office of Victim Services. Ms. Hamlet-Williams, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do have the family of the victim who would like to address the board today. There were also several statements that were sent in for the board's review. Um, we did receive that. Have, thank you. I'm sorry. Okay, good. Um, we do have the mother of the victim as well as the sister and the maternal grandmother who will be addressing the board today. And I'm going to unmute. I'm not sure who wants to go first, um, sister. You can unmute and you may begin. Please remember to keep your statements directed to the board members and not the inmates. Thank you. You're still muted. Oh, man. So hello, my name is Nancy. I am one of um, the victims impacted by the death of Lydia Janelli Gomez. And just really quickly, I want to show a photo of my sister. Okay. Okay. Um, I am not the only sibling she has left behind as there is six more siblings and she also leaves behind 16 nieces and nephews. Here we are 
30 years later with the unexpected news that has reopened wounds that never seem to heal. I believe in second chances, depending on the circumstances. In this case, it is different, not only because it was family, but because his actions were no accident. The actions that Charlie decided, sorry. The actions that Charlie decided to take deserve no second chances and no chance to walk freely. Janelli had just turned four years old. She was sweet, kind, loving, and innocent. I can't imagine how scared she was with no one around to protect her. Charlie took it upon himself to take the life of an innocent child, an innocent child. So a little girl, his own blood, baby cousin who couldn't defend herself even if she wanted to, who caused no harm to others. He had the chance to stop and realize that his actions were wrong, but he didn't. He watched her as she slept, pacing back and forth to make that final decision of, pace, of placing his hand over her tiny mouth no. and watched her struggle and grasp for air. At that time, if he wanted to, he could have stopped. He gave no second thought. No. Someone who isn't a monster would not plan their kill. Charlie had it planned. He knew what he was doing. He knew when the time was right for him. Like he mentioned, he knew he'd be in contact to accomplish his to accomplish and satisfy his needs. He confessed and stated in his own words that he had enjoyed the killing that seeing his young victim suffer made him feel good in the head. Who is to say it won't happen again? Let's not make that mistake by allowing this to repeat again. Charlie's actions has caused nothing but damage and pain. We cannot bring back the innocent little life that was taken. The damage he caused affects me to this day. I am a mother of two. It's sad that she can't be here to watch her niece and nephew grow. He caused trauma to our hearts and souls, leaving us with betrayal from the family we love and are supposed to trust most. One day I feel okay, and the next I'm in tears. I, feel for, I fear for my kids when family is near. I suffer from depression and anxiety. I take medications for both, which is something I'd never thought I'd have to do at a young age. I am unable to work without breaking down, especially when her birth month and the month of her passing is near. My kids continue to sleep in my room at their ages of nine and 12. They always ask, why can't they spend the night anywhere else like other kids? My response to them is when you get older, you will know. I try so hard to keep them safe from any harm. When I'm in public, I get paranoid and anxiety rises. It would only get worse. This family is not how it used to be. In which we thought family was everything. We are disconnected and hold fear with no trust. He has siblings that know what happened, but due to the loss of my sister, it caused separation. He affected the family so many ways. For example, our oldest brother blames himself for not protecting her when she needed him the most. He was only six years old when he witnessed Charlie's actions. My uncle developed bad habits since my sister's death in order to numb his pain. One of my aunts does not come out of her home and disconnect and distance herself from the family along with her kids because of course we all lost trust. My mother, who had never had the chance to grieve because she had other children to care for, lost herself in the process of being a mother during the horrible loss of her daughter. I remember some things, some things that will never go away. I remember being removed from my mother's care because she lost it all. Granted, she found a part of herself and got back up. With pain, she will forever and always ask, why her? My mother suffers from depression and continues to see, it, see a therapist along with taking meds. Last year, my mom had a mental breakdown and attempted to take her own life. 
and that was her grieving the loss of her beloved daughter. My mother's meds are given by a nurse daily because of her wanting to overdose. I have to call in and check on her to make sure that she remembers her kids love her dearly. During the holidays, my mother's not the same and never will be. She always cries and says how much she misses her baby girl. We will never forget Janelli. We will always speak of how she would have been, how she, if she would have been taller or shorter than me. We live in the what if, what if she was here? What if she would have had kids married? What if she would have been a teacher, a doctor? But that we will never know because her, li her life was taken too soon. Her life was taken to satisfy his own needs. As Charlie stated, he enjoyed it. It felt good. He showed no remorse. Charlie was sentenced for 60 years to life without parole for a reason. Caesar Charlie Amber was sentenced at the age of 20 to 60 years in prison for murder, sexual assault, and risk of injury to a minor in the slaying of Lydia Janelli Gomez. In the newspaper, it stated, if convicted of felony murder, Amber could be sentenced to death. My question is, what changed? Why go back on the words of the judge and allow the opportunity to be given parole? Charlie was sentenced for the amount of time for a reason. How does one become rehabilitated after taking someone's life and enjoying it? Lastly, his confessions, he stated, I always thought what it would feel like to kill any of the kids. What if that is not the end? His actions were done to satisfy his curiosity. What if curiosity hits again? Therefore, my ask is that you please consider not allowing him out on parole. He deserves to pay for the innocent life that he took by spending the rest of his life in jail. He shall suffer and remember what he once thought felt good and pay for his actions. For justice of Lydia Janelli Gomez, family is supposed to be the people that you trust the most. Instead, he, be, he betrayed us more than anyone could ever imagine. And that caused us a lifetime of grief, pain, hurt that is not comparable to anything else. Thank you. Thank you. Taylor Williams, do we have another statement? Anytime you want to touch can't hear you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Okay. I am the mother. Of, I am the mother of Lydia Ginelli Gomez, my little girl. And finally, I get to confront him. Give me a second. Lydia Ginelli Gomez was a four year old, old little girl who was kind, caring, loving, friendly to everyone around her. She was an innocent child whose life was taken for no reason, no reason. She loved her sisters and brother. She didn't get the chance to live her life, to go to school, to grow up and have a family. This robbed me of my chance to see her grow, to finish school, have a career, to start her own family, to grow up with her loved ones. He destroyed our family caused fear, depression, separation, to never trust anyone, loss of sleep. He wanted to know what it felt like to kill someone. And when he did it, he had said it felt good. No remorse, no guilt. Why should he get a second chance for freedom? What he did has no words. He, need what, he knew what he was doing. He already had plans to kill. He tore our family apart. Nothing he can say or do will bring back my baby, nothing. I've always asked myself, why her? 
Till this day, I still feel pain, anger, sadness, broken. Not a day goes by that I don't think of her and how her life could have been. He doesn't deserve a second chance to live his life. I fear that he will do this again. My family feels that he shouldn't be let free. Every member of this family wants nothing to do with him. We can never forgive him for what he has done. Since the death of my child, I've lost trust, sleep, anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts. I've been overprotective with my kids, my grandkids. I've been in therapy for 11 years now. I still cry over her death. If I had one wish, just one, it would be to have my baby girl with me again. I tried a few times to end my life. Many times I wish I could be with her. <laughs> so he was 13 years old when he committed the crime. But my daughter had turned, had just turned four. She had a whole life ahead of her. She didn't ask to be murdered. We didn't ask for this lifelong pain torture. Never did I have him babysit any of my kids. Never. And I never had him babysit. He was only let in because he was family and he was trusted. He babysit. No, I don't need to do that. He knows the truth. Well, I to guess. this day, I still want to die and I want to be with her. I want her back and I can never get that back. I'm never going to get her back. I don't want him out. He don't deserve to come out and enjoy life while she's 10 feet under. She didn't get her chance. So he shouldn't get his chance either. Thank you. Thank you. Go The grandmother, my mother. We can read that. That's your handwriting. And Linda needs the broken wounds open. I think you can pick it on it. Just no. know when you wrote it. I am the grandma of Lydia Janelli Gomez. Lydia Janelli Gomez was my granddaughter. She was the most sweet little girl you could ever meet. She loved life so much. She loved singing and she was anxious to go to school. My daughter Patty took her to school so she could see what school was like. She loved it. But Charles took her life away before she went to school. Her dream did not come true. He destroyed our families. We are all apart. My daughter. She's never been the same ever since. None of us have. My life without her also. Charlie has no heart to have. To have committed a horrendous crime to his own cousin and a little four year old girl who never did any harm to no one. Child does not deserve the light of day. He said he enjoyed it also. Rest in peace, Lydia Ginelli. I believe justice will be done. We have so much memories of Lydia. Beautiful memories in such a short, in such a short life. Well, Charles, your wish came true. You destroy the family. That's it. That's all the statements here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank At the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, the attorneys will be afforded the opportunity to make a statement. We will now turn it over to the public defender. Do you wish to proceed? Please. <clears throat> Sorry, yes, please. I think I was muted. Um, 
I think that everyone has really already talked about this, but there the facts are difficult to read. And no one could even wants to think about what really could ever truly empathize with the family for this sort of loss. I think that's all very true. And I think that's something I know I have learned that Cesar believes, and I believe that his statement today expressed that as well. Um, and I won't because um, I think Cesar is in a better position and has adequately, to the extent he can, because he acknowledges there really is nothing he can say, but that he understands the anguish that he caused to the victim's family, which he noted was his family, and the victims did state he destroyed a family. But I believe he mentioned that in his statement too. He's well aware of that and very, very remorseful for absolutely everything that he has done. I want to point out that not only did he say that today, but he has lived that for the last 30 years. And more specifically, that I think that the board has seen that even when someone, no, I'm going to step back. Cesar did not go to trial. Cesar did take a plea. That he did receive 60 years, which is the equivalent of life. That after that, he did not appeal anything. He did not file a habeas, and I will quickly address what he called a motion to correct. It was a, bun a number of advocates who were attorneys that were trying to get the 1584 law passed that filed on behalf of every person who was sentenced to a lengthy sentence under the age of 18, a motion to correct, saying that sentence because their youth had not been considered at the time were in violation of the Miller, I'm sorry, the, yes, the Miller and Graham rulings that that is not something that Cesar actively pursued. Rather, he was included in a class of persons that was trying to achieve the result, which we here today. Eventually the statute did pass and we are here today. But that besides that, there was no appeal. There was no habeas. There was no sentence modification attempt. There was no commutation attempt. That I think that's very rare to say nowadays, period, let alone for someone who's been in for 30 years let alone for someone who's done, quite frankly, as well as Cesar has done. I think that there are many people that come before this board and say, I'm a different person now than I was then. I think that can be no more true than in Cesar's situation. That I think it's well documented that this happened as a result of his mental health condition. Again, he, more than anyone, refuses to admit to accept that as an excuse that he has done everything he can in the last 30 years to file, follow the guidance of his mental health treatment, um, mental health treaters. To my surprise, he's very open that he is grateful that he was lucky enough, he tells me, to meet clinicians within the Department of Corrections that helped him. He has continued to comply with their recommendations for basically the entirety of his uh, I believe he enters about 94, and I believe that his compliance with mental health treatment and really his first opportunity, because it's around the time of his sentencing, as you know, not much is available before. I believe it's about 98 or 99, according to his records. That the, um, as the chair mentioned, he is a good timer. That's how long he's been in. That not only does he earn the 12 statutory days of good time, Cesar has maintained a seven day job during his entire incarceration. So he does also get the benefit of the statutory good time for having that job as well. Um, that I think I'll just say, I don't want to make this longer than it needs to be, that we are here today because a court has said that any sentence for any crime, even the most horrific ones, and we have certainly seen some horrific in this among the more, that any person who commits a crime under the age of 18, 18 should have the ability to benefit from rehabilitation during their incarceration and benefit from that rehabilitation by living a functional life outside of prison walls. Again, Cesar has done has absolutely asked for no extra graces 
he was part of a class action suit and he's um, attending this hearing as a statutory right. But I would nonetheless ask that he be granted parole today as he could, has done everything in prison to earn this release. He has a solid plan to continue to do what has gotten him this success so far. And in all of the times that I've talked to him, he's never veered from the fact that one, he com has complete remorse and shame from what happened. And two, he is going to continue to live his life in a way that in some small way could perhaps make up. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Frank. Okay, at this time, Mr. Amber, we will, the panel will enter into deliberation. Everyone is free to listen to our deliberation and we will get back to you with our decision. Okay. Very tragic, tragic case. Um, I wanna thank the, the victims, family members, of course, for being here and for, we know this is painful, for um, providing the panel with, with statements. Um, Nothing there, you know, I can't express enough how sorry I am for their loss. So, Mr. Amber, it, it is it's very clear he's not the, the same person that he was when he came into the Department of Correction at, at 17. Um, happy to see that he has taken advantage of all of the services and programming that the Department of Correction has to offer. Um, it appears as though, uh, he has been stable for quite some time now and has found a regimen um, that helps him to be successful and productive within the facility. He's taken every program available to him and he has um, addressed his, his um, needs. Uh, I do believe that, that he is remorseful now that he has a clear mind and can accept what he has done and understand the pain that he's caused so many people as a result of his actions. Um, however, uh, the the nature of this crime, um, it is very rare that we, we see such a horrific crime, a crime of this magnitude. And um, the, the nature of it is just too much for me to overcome. Um, as I stated before, he is receiving 12 days a month in, in good time. The most he'll do is uh, 41 years of this 60 year sentence, uh, assuming that he continues to gain that. Um, and the, the injury and impact to the victim and, and the victim's family, uh, coupled with the nature, is just too much for me. So uh, my vote would be to deny parole. Ms. Palmieri. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I. Uh, echo concur with all your statements uh, i do um, see that mr amber is incredibly remorseful i think it was in, through all the evaluations that he had done um, through his parole hearing and in today's hearing the remorse and the shame that he ultimately feels for what he's done i think he was quite honest in 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 his statement where, you know, if it was him making the decision, he wouldn't be able to vote himself to parole either. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to overlook that he was 17 years old, mm -hmm. suffering from a psychotic break. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really, in my opinion, um, a failure in part of the the mental health system at the time where his mother took him for treatment, mm -hmm. wanted him to be um, looked like from reading the documents, placed in an inpatient uh, environment where he would be, where they would be able to manage uh, what he was saying was wrong with him, hearing voices. Um, I am grateful that he was able to appreciate all the mental health providers throughout the Department of Corrections that have worked with him uh, to accept his illness, accept his criminal convictions, 
and work through all these years to find a medic a regimen of medications that um, allow him as he put it in one of our intake you know to be able to kind of be normal to, to live every day in his in uh, and work and communicate um as such um i i understand You know, I, I don't understand, I guess, you know, what it is to be the victim's family. There is no way to understand that, just no way. Um, the harm, the grief, the every, as it was mentioned, dates that bring up all of that. Um, I guess my, my concern is when we, to deny parole, is for public safety, is for injury and impact to the victim. Um, Mr. Amber then comes out roughly around the age of 63 with no community supervision um, because he's got a flat sentence. 11 years from now. Yeah, yeah I had him, we're with 58. 58, okay, I had his end of sentence at, two, at 2040. He's still earning 12 years. Okay, so late 50s then, um, you know, with no supervision. I, I think that it's somewhat concerning. He seems, you know, when questioning about his medication, he understands all that it is and all that it does and why it's important to take. I guess my, my concern is that there would be no sort of support network at that point. Um, you know, his, who knows what his support system will, will be. Mm -hmm. If it will be there right. still, you know, it, it is a ways away. So it, as, although I do understand um, and agree with the denial for today, I, I do, you know, would like to see some mechanism of, of maybe bringing him back at some point to ensure that he is still managing in a in a positive way and constructively living his life within the facility, adhering to all the, the mental health uh, requirements, and further show that he's stable to be out in the community. And they're also allowing some level of community supervision uh, of an independent nature outside his family support to provide that level of public safety and um, and to give Mr. Amber uh, also sort of a mechanism of another support system. Um, I, I know that there's concern about for the victims and putting them through this again. I just, you know, for me, there's that other piece where you know, he he seems as though he'll go back, he'll work, he'll maybe continue with some level of schooling. Um, but to wait to end a sentence with no community supervision, I think it is offers some sort of risk to the community and does not provide uh, any level of community support for Mr. Amper. So I, although I'm a, I, I will, agree that um, vote for a denial today, I would also like to the panel to consider rehearing him. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. Ms. Page. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, you know, I think that uh, these cases are, in particular, are very difficult because their child committing an offense, but in this offense, it's child victim, you know, um, and I think that that tugs, that tugs at all of our hearts just as women and as mothers. Um, and, and so it's it was difficult for me um, not to put myself in the position of uh, the victim because I just, it's just relatable is all I can say. And it, it really does. It really is a horrible, horrible part. Um, I do appreciate the the victims, as you said, Madam Chair, uh, coming forward. You know what the mother said 
this is my chance to finally speak out mm-hmm. and, you know, to confront him. Um, and I appreciate that she was, maybe this can be a pivotal point in her life where since she got that off of her chest, maybe she can start the healing process, you know, and be in a better place. Um, Mr. Amber uh, has done phenomenal. He's educated himself. He's tapped into his religion. He's been medicated. Um, and he has been remorseful. He's emotional right now. Um, just hearing from his the victims' uh, family uh, and how it's impacted them. So it's there's no doubt in my mind that uh, Mr. Amber is remorseful and that he has really taken his time to work on himself since he's been in the facility. Um, I came in here uh, with a denial um, and having him come back for the very same reason that uh, Ms. Palmieri stated that he was serving a flat sentence. Um, and um, I, I think, that, I mean, although I can appreciate the, the answer to our question, right? you know, mm-hmm. like he was honest. I, I just, I, I appreciate his efforts and the efforts of his attorney, but I'm going to vote again to deny uh, his request for discretionary parole based on the injury and impact to the victims and also the nature and circumstance of the offense. But I would have him back. Um, I would, um, and that I guess we could discuss. But um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I hate you know those the point. nature and circumstance and the victim impacts are never going to change. Never, no, nope, it's not. And yeah, I mean, I understand the flat sentence and the concern. I mean, I also understand that DOC has discharge planners and and they would work on his release. Um, I mean. There's not much left for him to do there, but continue to do what he's doing, exactly. I suppose. Um, there isn't much for him to do. And so, I mean, and I guess in the same vein, it's like, have him do what and come back? You know what I mean? It's just, what, you hope that the victims don't show up or, you know. That no, no, no. But I, I think, you know, he could continue to work. Maybe he would further his education. To, those will be positive. Those will also assist him in coming out. Um, I also think it gives it a little bit, it gives additional time to ensure that he's stable on medication, that he continues to, um, you know, that he doesn't have any disciplinary reports related to maybe being off his medication. Because I think, yeah. and I, I speak for myself, I, I think, you know, the, the number one concern or fear is that you know, Mr. Amber would be in the community, he would stop taking his medication yeah, or, of course. or it would not work the same way it, ha- it has been working while he's in right. this structured environment in the community. And then, you know, there's a risk. Yeah. You know, what that risk is, nobody really can say. Right. But I, I, I'm not saying well, maybe the victims won't come back and, you know, no. they should come back, right. you know. I am saying that I think in terms of community for uh, the community, I think is best served with some level of supervision for Mr. Amber. And I think Mr. Amber is best served with an independent um, outside his family level of uh, monitoring and support. Yeah. So okay. I, what about five years? Are you again, five years? Five years. Yes. All right. Okay. In the matter of Cesar Amber, MA number 229555, I'll make a motion to deny parole at this time. We'll rehear the case in five years, March of 2029. Denial for the following reasons, the nature and circumstance of the instant offenses and the injury and impact to the victim and the victim's family. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Amber, we would uh, encourage you to continue with programming and services and work and education while you're in the community and avoid any further um, disciplinary infractions prior to your next hearing. Thank you uh, to everyone for your participation here today. This concludes the 1584 hearing for Cesar Amber. It is 12.22 p.m. It also concludes
The entire thing is madness. It's completely insane. You know, where is the DA? At the beginning, they say there's there's no district attorney's office. There's no one from the office here. How can you not show up to a case like this? This is a monster. It's, you know, it's so... It, what I can't understand is how everyone on the board and, and in this, it's like, well, he, he, he was mentally unwell. You know, he, he, he it, it was in a way it's a failure of, of the health system because he, you know, he had signs of, of problems and they should have put him on, on meds. It's, it's, but now he's on meds. So everything's okay. And it's like, why are you, completely discounting the fact that he can simply be a sociopathic evil being why is psychopathy thrown out the window completely Th that doesn't make any you don't have a right to just make that assumption there are people that are evil there are people that cannot feel empathy why do you make the assumption that because he comes up with the right answer, which is you should never get out, that that that's what that, that that means he means it, that that means he has regret? What about what about the idea that he simply has learned what to say? Why is that not an option? I know what I picked up on is that he never, sh I didn't see it. I didn't see it. When, when the families were talking, he put his head down, which is again, something that maybe he, he, you can learn, you can learn it as, as a, as a psychopath. But the only time he cried, which he did cry was when they were talking about him at the end. When it was about him, when it was about his chance of getting free or not. And only then did he shed a tear. Not in the most, during the traumatic, heartfelt speeches of the, the pain that you heard in your mother's voice. Why is it an assumption that he's simply not, you know, it, it, that is a, an illness in itself, right? To be a, a psychopath, to just completely lack the ability to feel empathy. But that doesn't, <laughs> you know, that, that not all psychopaths go and, and, and kill little girls. Many of them are, are, are flying F-16s or... You know, maybe they're Navy SEALs. Maybe they're, they're 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 surgeons. They're putting their ability to to not be nervous under under pressure to good use. And others kill little children after they sexually assault them because they wanted to know what it would feel like. It's it, it it's so disturbing that they give him a plea deal of 60 years then because he somehow earns 12 days a month a good time he's gonna get out after serving just 41 years he's getting out no matter what in 10 years 2035 why And they feel that they should put the family through this again in five years? They have to come back again? Why? For the chance that he'll be set free five years earlier? <laughs> Why? It's madness. And why is it that that we, we we can so clearly see the insanity in this, but it seems that those in charge can't. 
for God's sake, he has a low risk score. How does someone who kills a four-year-old after sexually assault their cousin nonetheless because they want to know what it feels like, how can that person ever have a low risk score? I'm um, sorry, we're not we're not the PhDs that write the algorithm for this. I mean, we wouldn't understand. I know. I know. We're just sheeple. You know, it was interesting too how the board asked, well, how was it when you when you showed up to prison that your violent tendencies they completely went away? You you have no violent offenses while in prison. And it's like, how can you even say that? There there are no four-year-old little girls in prison. Who the hell is he gonna beat up in prison? Are you kidding me? Look at him. It's like the it's like these tone deaf questions and I what is going on in your mind? You know, there are some times that these board members they handle themselves and I'm like, wow, that's impressive. But there are other times when it's a question. How do you ask a question like that? Are you kidding me? I just don't get it. How is it possible that no matter what, he's going to be getting out in 10 years, 2035, after serving 41 years of a 60? This is, you know, you talk about the, the the everything being broken, and this is why we do this. And we'll read this, in, in, but I just... This is a little girl who is sexually assaulted and killed. Then the DA just says 60 years because they don't want to worry, go to court or anything. Then when he comes up, then the system says, you know, what? it was a week before your 18th birthday. So you're considered a child, not an adult. So now you can get commutation sentence and you can get 12 days every month off of your off of your sentence just because why not? And so you're going to get out no matter what 41 years into your 60 year sentence. You'll be out in your 50s, which is decades. So, but you actually can have a commutation hearing, and then you can you, we can put the victims through this again, and you can get out. And then when you fail, we'll give you another one. But, and we won't even show up as a DA to stand there and represent the victims. Yet he he has a public defender. He has someone sitting there next to him. I don't know who she is. I, I missed that part, but she just sits there, I guess, as a to be a comfort to him. And who's writing about this? Who's standing on behalf of the victims? To even mention that they can start beginning the healing process. What, what, what insanity to say that? You don't heal from this. You don't ever heal from this. This was written in 1994. And thank you, Richard. Patricia Gomez tried to keep quiet, crying silently in her handkerchief in April as she watched her cousin appear in court to face allegations that he sexually assaulted and murdered Gomez's four-year-old daughter. But as Caesar, Charlie Amber, was led back to jail, Gomez was unable to hold her voice. Charlie, why did you do it? She shouted, her words punctuated by sobs. Why you kill my baby? Amber didn't look back. But a day earlier, he had given police a chilling answer to that puzzling question, revealing an obsessive curiosity about what it would feel like to kill a child. That morbid confession will likely play a key role in a scheduled hearing today to determine if there is enough evidence to bring him, who is now 18, to trial. The hearing to be in Hartford Superior Court is required in all murder cases. That obsession flared whenever Gomez asked Amber to babysit for her according to Amber's confession, and he said the urge overtook him as he climbed into Lydia Ganelli Gomez's bunk, hovered over the sleeping four-year-old. Lydia was found dead the night of April 9th under the porch of her Putman home. She had been reported missing at dawn that day. Yes, he hid her under the porch. Amber helped search for her, but confessed during an interrogation later in the day, police said. He even helped search for her. In a subsequent written confession included in an affidavit that led Amber's arrest, 
Ambert said that when he was in National Guard camp, uh, Waker boot camp in, in the Antic, I started to think about killing people or myself, which he was kicked out of boot camp in mid-March and later spent the week at Gomez's home where he occasionally babysat her five children. I watched her kids, he wrote. I always thought what it would feel like to kill any of the kids. This is this is someone who they're let, going to let out regardless of what happens in 10 years. Can you imagine that? Can you even imagine that? What world do we live in? How is this possible? But it is. On Tuesday, April 5th, Gomez asked him if he could watch the children Friday and Saturday night. He said he would. I knew on Tuesday that I would be babysitting that weekend, he wrote. I slept at Patty's house on Tuesday, and during the night I was thinking about killing one of the kids. The thoughts returned Thursday, and again on Friday, he wrote. He and Goma's boyfriend were smoking and looking uh, the devil's lettuce and looking after the children. After the boyfriend went to bed, I started thinking that I wanted to kill somebody. I was high. I walked into the bedroom and climbed on the bunk bed and watched her as she slept. So there's that we caught him in a lie, right? Because she said that he wasn't, that he was completely sober at this hearing. Um, which is not that any of it would make a difference, but I think there is a point to point out that he lied at his commutation hearing. What he said was not true at his commutation hearing. He said he watched for several min minutes, nudged her, and left. He watched Arciano's hall on television. Then he paced the kitchen floor. Then he returned to the bedroom. Climbing back into the bed, he wrote, he held his hand to the little girl's face and pressed down until she went limp. He carried her out of the house and stashed her body under the porch. Later, police said he confessed to raping the girl hours before the killing when he took her into the bathroom. The defense may try to challenge the confession, arguing that it was coerced or that he merely repeated lines fed to him by the police. Yeah, okay. Ambert's mother said her son told her he felt like something evil had invaded his mind but his lawyer assistant public defender steve moran said wednesday he would have no comment on this defense strategy at the end of the confession he wrote that he had enjoyed killing that seeing his young victim suffer made me feel good in my mind but later but earlier he expressed remorse saying he didn't want her to die huh I never planned for this to happen. I'm sorry that it happened, he wrote. I'm sorry that this happened. Wow, the 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 infamous, I'm sorry it happened. Not I'm sorry I did it. Not holy God, what did I? I'm sorry that it happened. As if it somehow just magically happened. Can you imagine that a man who says this, who confesses to doing these type of things, will actually get out? Will actually get out after just 41 years to be public to be to be mm -hmm. um then this is the the i guess after he was sentenced to so just 60 years um <laughs> how that's possible Lydia's mother, Patricia Gomez, 627, had earlier told the judge the wonderful, wonderful child that he had been. Um, his lawyers had initially asked for a three-judge panel to try this case, including testimony from doctors that he might be legally insane. And of course you're insane when you do this. But it doesn't mean you don't spend the rest of your life in prison. But, but he agreed to plead guilty Tuesday in exchange for 60 years recommended sentence. The key evidence in the case was that he, his confession that he sexually assaulted and strangled the girl um, he said that he was often high on drugs and alcohol. He told police he initially agreed to trade. He initially wanted to trade her to a man named Fat Pete for beer and drugs. Later, he said he killed her because he wanted to know how it would feel. He said he had begun thinking about um, killing someone while he was the camp wicker in 1994 when he was kicked out in March of that year for fighting. He spent some nights at the home of Patricia Gomez. It's interesting. He fought someone else other than a child. 
who knows they probably were younger than him amber was accused of duh. i watched her kids and that's um it made the new york times and everything this uh But now it it won't even no one would know about this if we didn't do it. No one would know. Now what will happen? I don't know. Maybe people can see what's happening in our system and demand change. Maybe they can say that just because he was a week before he turned 18, maybe certain crimes shouldn't fall under the umbrella of Certain crimes, you shouldn't get good time, 12 days a month. Certain crimes, you shouldn't be allowed to bring the family every five years until you're set free to listen to you. Certain crimes should be exempt from certain commutation laws. I don't even know where to go with this. It's just so upsetting. And I think that most, I, I, I can't, I, I, I would imagine that the majority of people watching this would feel similar. I just do. And that's where it makes you say, well, who, who is it? Who is it that these laws, who is benefiting from him being set out? Who is benefiting? No one. Society is not benefiting by him being free. And what you're doing at best, if you want to have a debate around this, is that you're rolling the dice. You're flipping a coin. No one can say with any certainty that he is not going to harm again, that he over the course of another 50 years of his life, or maybe you could say 40 years or whatever the number is, that's a lot of days that he is not going to snap. No, you can't say that. So then you're saying, well, well what percentage, what are the chances that he's going to do something? And then you're going to say, well, then who benefits by taking the chance? No one. I mean, with all of those facts in mind, how can you take our, an unknown risk? You can risk that he might go and take another child's life or assault another child. Why? So he can be free? So you want to risk? You can't. You can't do it. Wow. It's, uh, you probably wouldn't believe it if you didn't see it, but, but you did, you know, we all know that terrible crime exists, but it's a whole different story when the system does nothing to protect, to protect us from these monsters. And, uh, thank you, Richard, for the info with that. I'll let you go.